Our first uh, presenter is Samuel Henderson. He's the CSO of uh, Saracen. Are you with us, Sam? Yes, I'm here. There he is. So, so Saracen is a biopharmaceutical company focused on uh, the discovery and development of drugs to treat and prevent uh, diseases of the brain, which is uh, very worthy work. So, uh, so Samuel, are you ready to present to us today? Uh, yeah, can you see the screen now? Yeah, absolutely. Great. So, so what I'll do is I'll drop out uh, on video, and if we're running over running on time, I'll I'll just pop in and let you know. Okay. Great. Over to you. All right. So I, I didn't know there was a million dollars at stake here. So now you've made me much more nervous. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, Saracen. Uh, I'm as I mentioned, I'm the chief scientific officer there. Uh, what we've been trying to do over the last several years is leverage ketosis to treat neurological diseases. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so what we, what we focus on is targeting bioenergetics and metabolism for neurological diseases. And in particular, we're focusing on ketone bodies as neurotherapeutics. Um, and so as we'll talk about today, uh, ketone bodies act as not only simple energy substrates for the brain and peripheral tissues, they also act as signaling molecules in a variety of, of pathways. Um, and just a bit of, of nomenclature here. Um, so in, in humans, there are three main ketone bodies, um, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which I'll frequently refer to as BHB. Uh, that's the most common ketone body found in humans. Then there's acetoacetate. And acetoacetate is somewhat unstable and it will spontaneously decarboxylate to form uh, acetone. Um, so just sort of briefly to give you an overview of the company, uh, Saracen. Um, so, you know, we view us as the leading company in the field of bioenergetics and metabolism. Um, right now we have two programs in phase two, um, a study in infantile spasms and migraine prevention, which I'll talk about later. Uh, we also have a phase three program in Alzheimer's disease uh, that we hope to launch early next year. Uh, we have two long-term Fortune 500 investors uh, those are the Nestle Group out of Switzerland uh, and Wilmar Group out of uh, Singapore. Uh, we have global offices, both um, in Singapore, the US and Australia. Uh, we have a very experienced CNS drug development team. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll have two data readouts in next year, uh, both our infantile spasm study and our migraine study. And again, we hope to start our Alzheimer's disease study next year as well. Um, so, you know, what we're the focus of the company is really to sort of build on this idea of the use of ketogenic diets in treating neurological diseases um, that has been around for quite some time. Um, probably many of you are familiar with ketogenic diets. Um, the first sort of therapeutic use of the ketogenic diet was done back in the 1920s by Dr. Russell Wilder at the Mayo Clinic. Um, so he was building on these observations that fasting reduced seizure frequencies uh, among epileptics. And particularly among children. Uh, so he recognized that ketogenic diets actually physiologically mimic fasting. Um, so he instituted these ketogenic diets in a variety of epilepsies and found that again, consistent with the fasting reports that this reduced seizure frequencies. And uh, this has been implemented over the years and it is sort of, sort of standard of care at, at many facilities now. Um, the sort of a classic ketogenic diet uh, it's typically composed of a four to one ratio, like so four grams or units of fat to every one gram or combined unit of protein and carbohydrates. Um, so if you've ever actually tried one of these ketogenic diets, particularly a, a traditional ketogenic diet, which is so heavy in fat, you realize compliance is very difficult uh, to, to maintain these diets for a very long time. Um, so what we've been trying to do is sort of, sort of put a ketogenic diet in a pill or sort of drugify the ketogenic diet. Uh, and as I mentioned, our main focuses are Alzheimer's, epilepsy, and migraine. Uh, there are several recent reviews on these topics, which I've highlighted here. Um, you know, we've done quite a bit of work on exogenous ketosis in Alzheimer's disease. And there are also several publications showing uh, efficacy of, of improved cognitive performance in subjects with ketogenic diets in Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned, there's a long history of use of ketogenic diets and epilepsy. And as I'll talk about later in the talk, uh, it's a really interesting set of literature on the use of ketogenic diets in, in migraine prevention. 
Um, so just sort of a brief overview of ketogenesis. Uh, most people are probably familiar with that now as the sort of keto movement is quite popular. Um, so just very briefly, you know, in conditions of low glucose availability, such as fasting, uh, your adipocytes will release free fatty acids. Uh, these free, free fatty acids will travel to the liver uh, where they'll be oxidized to produce acetyl-CoA. Now, if there's enough excess acetyl-CoA, that'll be condensed to form ketone bodies. The liver can't metabolize ketone bodies, so they're released in the circulation for use by extrahepatic tissues. Um, and one of their main functions is to be a uh, fuel sub sub substrate as an alternative to glucose. And there were studies done in the, the 1960s by George Cahill and others, uh, which found that ketone bodies can provide up to 60% of the total brain's energy needs. Um, so again, one of the key functions of ketone bodies is to act as a fuel substrate in conditions of, of low glucose availability, such as fasting. Um, over the last seven or eight years or so, um, ketone bodies have actually been found to be more than just a simple fuel source. They also act as signaling molecules that signal to the body that it is in a fasting state. Um, there's several recent reviews on this. Um, this figure is, is adapted from a recent review by John Newman and Eric Burden out of the Buck Institute. Um, I won't really have time to go over all of the different pathways that um, ketone bodies uh, work through. I'll just mention one. Um, which I think is, is very important and relevant. Um, so ketone bodies are found to be uh, inhibit histone deacetylases. Um, and so they're HDAC inhibitors, uh, which then has you know, implications for both transcription factors and collagen structure, which leads to the expression of different genes. Um, so for example, it, it, it increases oxidative stress resistance, uh, increases insulin sensitivity, mitochondrial function, and overall found to be both neuro and, and cytoprotective in general. Um, the other sort of pathway I think is very interesting is that ketone bodies have been shown to be potent anti-inflammatory molecules. Uh, and this has been traced down to the ability of ketone bodies to modulate um, cellular potassium levels, which affects assembly of the inflammasomes. Um, so over, overall, these ketone bodies seem to be doing more than just fuel. They seem to have these very strong uh, cytoprotective and, and neuroprotective properties. And I think that the ability of ketone bodies to do this fits very nicely with the disposable soma theory of aging. Um, so probably many of you are familiar with this given the audience for metabesity, uh, but just very briefly and simply, what the disposable soma theory of aging postulates is that organisms can devote resources to one of two pathways, either growth or reproduction or sort of maintenance and repair. So it's called somatic maintenance here. So when an organism has ample food, it devotes resources towards growth and reproduction because evolutionarily reproduction is king and you need to reproduce. Uh, but when food is limited, um, then you devote resources to somatic maintenance. So you start doing maintenance and repair, and this confers longevity to organisms. Um, so that's very, very nicely uh, with the findings from caloric restriction, which increases longevity. Um, and also uh, modulation of nutrient sensing pathways such as mTOR and AMPK, which also seem to have um, improvements in longevity. And so I think it makes sense that a signaling molecule for fasting state would have these sort of same sort of properties to help improve um, longevity. And I think that makes it a good target for, for lots of neurological diseases, particularly age-related neurological diseases. Um, so consistent with this idea, there's been several studies um, demonstrating, for example, this one in mice that use a cyclic ketogenic diet um, that found that while a cyclic ketogenic diet didn't extend the overall lifespan of the, of the mice, it did improve their, their, life, their midlife properties, I guess. Uh, so improve their health span, let's call it that. Um, so they, they lived, they died less in midlife and they used the composite aging score and found by testing various things in cognition and motor function, that those animals who were on the cyclic ketogenic diets uh, did, were less aged than the animals who were on control diets. Uh, similarly, in, in, a, in a paper done in C. elegans where they directly treated uh, the worms with BHB, they found this increased overall lifespan. Um, and those of you who are familiar with this pathway, they, they, they found that this was DAS16 dependent um, and that the BHB activated a, a target of DAS16, which is superoxide dismutase which again is consistent with the idea that um, ketone bodies are sort of uh, have anti-aging properties. Um, 
So as I mentioned, you know, being on a ketogenic diet is quite difficult. Uh, so what we've been trying to do is induce a ketosis by exogenous um, means. Um, so what we use is a, our first generation compound is called tricapillin. Um, it's a medium chain triglyceride uh, composed of C8 fatty acids. Um, and when ingested um, in your GI tract, these C8 fatty acids are cleaved off and they behave very differently than more traditional long chain fatty acids. Um, so these go directly via the portal vein to the liver uh, where they undergo obligate oxidation. Um, and if you ingest a sufficient amount of tricapillin, this will induce ketosis for several hours. Um, and those ketone bodies will then be released in the circulation uh, to be used both as a fuel source for the brain um, and also to have these sort of signaling properties. Um, so we've tested this in, in several models, in particular Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, I don't really feel the need to, to go over what Alzheimer's disease is. Unfortunately, many of us are all too familiar with this disease. Uh, and probably a lot of you have sort of personal uh, experience with it. Uh, but just what I want to mention in this slide is, has been discussed in, in several talks during the conference here, is that as the global population ages, Alzheimer's disease has become a bigger problem. Um, and it's going to become a particularly large problem in Asia. Um, and this was sort of one of the motivations for moving our headquarters to Singapore would be to have access to these patients, uh, notably in, in these Asian countries. Um, so we, you know, we've done a series of studies um, using tricapillin in Alzheimer's disease patients. Um, this is one of our first studies, um, Rieger et al., uh, where it was acute dosing, where we found that we could induce ketosis in subjects with tricapillin, and we could improve uh, the cognitive performance of the AD patients, uh, particularly those who were APOE4 and non-carriers. Uh, we then went on to do a 90-day study where we sort of replicated the earlier results uh, and we found those subjects who were dosage compliant and APOE4 nine carriers, uh, we did very well and we could improve their cognitive performance um, quite a bit. Uh, I'll mention, you know, this approach has been tried by others as well, particularly a guy named Stephen Cudane at the University of Sherbrooke, who's done a really nice set of work on this topic as well as us. Um, and this is a study uh, done by Tarazian and all at UCLA, where they actually used tricapillin and we're able to show that um, improvement in regional cerebral blood flow among APOE4 non-carriers. Um, so this is all sort of pointing, I think, towards a very promising approach towards the management of, of Alzheimer's disease. And, and hopefully we will see more of this in, in coming studies, both from us and, and others. Um, you know, we've had an interest in sort of epilepsy for a while now. Um, so our sort of first foray into epilepsy has been in infantile spasms. Uh, so if you're not familiar with this, this is a rare pediatric seizure disorder, typically occurs in infants. 90% uh, of the cases are children who are less than one year old. Um, it's also known as West syndrome. Uh, it's characterized by uh, subtle seizures. Um, and these children can have quite a few seizures. They can have hundreds of seizures in a day. Um, and if they're not effectively treated, uh, it can lead to both um, cognitive and motor delays physical deterioration. So it's very important to treat these children early. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an orphan indication. Um, so it typically occurs in two to four per 10,000 live births per year, so it's quite rare. Um, the standard treatment for infantile spasms is use of hormone treatments, such as ACTH or Vigabitrin. Uh, but a lot of centers also use a ketogenic diet, uh, which shows good efficacy in reducing the seizures in, in these children. In some cases, they even use these as first-line treatments uh, for, the, for the cases because it's quite benign compared to ACTH treatment and, and Vigabitrin, which have um, some serious side effects. Um, to sort of, sort of test this idea, uh, we used a rat model of infantile spasms developed by Dr. Morris Scantleberry at the University of Calgary. Um, and so we tested tricapillin both via oral gavage and administration with the milk, uh, we found in this rat model, we could reduce the occurrence of the seizures in, in sort of a dose-dependent manner. Um, so sort of using this data, uh, we went on to uh, file for a rare pediatric drug, drug designation and orphan drug designation by the US FDA. Uh, last year, we were granted both of those. Uh, we have a pre-IND meeting plan with the US FDA uh, probably with the end of this year. Um, and we hope to start the, this, the proof of concept study um, either this year or early next year. 
Uh, again, I, I'm sort of running a little late here, so I, I won't really talk a lot about migraine. I think most people know what migraines are, um, and they can be quite debilitating and, and cause quite a bit of loss of productivity among subjects who suffer from migraines. Um, so, you know, in a, in a minute I'll talk to you why we sort of want to address uh, migraines with ketogenic diets. Um, so there's actually a really interesting set of literature based on this. Um, so as you probably know, ketogenic diets are also very effective for weight loss. Um, so there were a series of studies going back to the 1920s where they found that people who were on these ketogenic diets for weight loss, who also were migraineurs, reported that their migraines essentially went away or they had very few migraines when they were on a ketogenic diet, but when they went off the ketogenic diet, the migraines came back. Um, so people then sort of followed up on that and there've been a series of studies, particularly like DiLorenzo, um, looking at the role of, of ketogenic diets in reducing uh, the occurrence of migraines. Uh, it was a really interesting paper they published in 2019 uh, where they compared a, a very low calorie ketogenic diet with a very low calorie non-ketogenic diet such that they increased the amount of carbohydrates in the diet, then that that did not as effectively reduce the occurrence of, of migraines. So really pointing towards a, a sort of a ketogenic mechanism for the reduction of, of, of migraines. Um, so sort of test if, if the induction of ketosis by tricapillin can reduce migraine frequencies. We we started a, a phase two proof of pilot <clears throat> or pilot proof of concept study. Uh, the study is underway right now. Uh, we plan to enroll about 100 subjects. Uh, it's a randomized little line placebo controlled trial being conducted in Australia. Uh, we just closed uh, recruitment um, in September 30th. Um, and so we hope to have results of this study um, early next year. Um, and just sort of in summary, you know, we have a diversified pipeline of products. Uh, so we're targeting Alzheimer's disease, migraine, infantile spasms. Uh, you know, we're also developing next generation ketosis inducing products um, and are in licensing uh, new assets. Um, so I, I just want to end by saying thank you to all the patients and caregivers who participated in our trials over the years. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, please just look up our website or, or contact me directly. Thank you. Great, Samuel. Thank you. Those are excellent presentations. So, as you as you move now into your phase three, um, you know what can you understand now with Biogen's experience and the FDA and obviously the work they've been doing with uh, Aduhelm. You know that's coming your way as well. So, what are your thoughts on all of that? So, I mean, I think <clears throat> you know that's really for good or bad. You know, it's sort of the FDA has become much more flexible on what it will accept for treatment of Alzheimer's disease, right? In the case of Adderhelm, they decided that just reduction of beta amyloid is, is sufficient to possibly predict lower or improvement in, in cognitive performance. So I think this has opened up the idea that there's more flexibility at the FDA um, for what they'll consider approval for, for a drug, right? Because formerly they had always said, if you're gonna get Alzheimer's disease, you need two outcomes, you need a cognitive endpoint and you need a functional endpoint. And they seem to have opened that up to allow for simply a, a change in biomarkers. Mm -hmm. uh, whether this is good, good or bad for the field, uh, we'll have to wait and see, but. Well, I guess it's encouraging for you as you, as you move into that phase three that uh, at least there's some trailblazer ahead of you. Now, in terms of the phase three implementation, you know, a, a lot of companies, have a tendency to expect that they're going to sell their IP to a big farmer at that point to take them through to phase three. Uh, what, what about yourself? I mean, do you have the financial firepower to be able to push through that phase three to approval? Uh, uh, I mean, that's sort of the plan, right? We, we're planning on having an IPO next year to sort of fund that phase three trial. I mean, as that's you point right. out, right, they're, they're extremely expensive. Um, you know, you need, because you're, you're dealing with a lot of subjective cognitive endpoints, you need a large number of subjects. Um, so this will be quite a costly study. You know, we're, we're, meant, we're gonna be a global study in multiple countries, you know, large number of subjects. Um, so, but the, the, the plan right now is to have an IPO and fund that study ourselves. Great, well, I mean, good, good luck with that. I mean, obviously <laughs> we wanna see plenty of uh, longevity focused IPOs happening in the marketplace. So uh, interesting, interesting something that you have uh, Nestle as, as a strategic investor. I know that they've been quite active in cognitive impairment with you know, even uh, medical foods and so on. Do, do you see that there's a, a blurring now of the lines between 
where you know big food conglomerates like Nestle and uh, Big Pharma are going to start understanding that's happening. You know, that the landscape is changing more towards prevention. Um, you know, and is that reflected in perhaps your your shareholder base? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Nestle has for for quite a while been a supporter of us. I think for exactly those reasons that you point out, they, they see this sort of blurring of pharma and food. And I think we even heard that yesterday from the, the guy from PepsiCo. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that's a good thing, right? Because, you know, probably, you know, most of sort of debilitating diseases like heart disease and Alzheimer's disease are diet associated. Um, and if we can start targeting sort of those early interventions just in diet and food, you know, composition of food and, you know, dietetic foods and lower carbohydrate foods. I think that will have a big impact on reducing the occurrence of these debilitating diseases later in life. So I think Nestle recognizes that. I think PepsiCo recognizes that. I think we recognize that. And I think I even heard it over and over again during this, this really excellent conference. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're aware of it happening with some of the uh, investment deals that we're seeing. So uh, just, we've got a couple more minutes, Sam. So if I may just ask you a couple of more technical questions, a question that came in from, uh, Bruce Frankel, which was, uh, do statins block production of ketone bodies? How does serotonin interact with statins? Uh, so we, you know, a lot of our patients have, have been on statins, obviously, um, and we see no effect of statins on the production of ketone bodies. So we, we haven't okay. seen that at all. all right, good to hear. And then uh, Christine Peterson was saying, why did uh, uh, APOE4 carriers not respond? Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, so short answer is we don't really know. Um, sort of the, the long complicated answer is that it's a really interesting set of literature from uh, Yassine Hussein out of UC Irvine, I think, uh, where he's been looking at what's the role of APOE4 in transport across the brain. Um, and so he's demonstrated that, for example, you know, omega-3 fatty acids are transported very poorly across the brain in APOE4 carriers. Um, and so he's doing a study now, a larger study now, to show that if this effect is real. So I suspect that ketone bodies may also not be transported very effectively across the brain in APOE4 carriers, so that they, they don't respond, or they may need a larger dose or longer exposure to get them to respond. And we'll be testing that in, in our next study, actually. Great. So the international study that you're carrying out, uh, what would be your proposed first market? You mentioned Asia being a big one. Would you look to get your first approvals in the US or would you consider being, you know, perhaps China or Japan or one of those uh, major markets in the in the Far East being, being your first market? Uh, I mean, I, I think the first market will be the US to get approval and then we'll move to other markets. China, right. Asia, Japan. Yeah. You've got a, got a lot of work ahead of you in the next year, yeah. haven't you? We do, yeah. Great. Well, thanks very much for your presentation today. It's fascinating and you know, great work. So uh, very best of luck with the IPO next year. And thanks for joining us today. All right. Thank you.